The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. Hello, welcome to The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. My name is Joni Siegel and I'm the host for this podcast. Today's episode is episode number 217. We have an interview today. We are going to be interviewing a gentleman by the name of Jeff Nash. Once involved in drugs, illegal activities, and incarceration, today Jeff Nash is a role model for change as the CEO of Habilitat Hawaii, a long-term addiction treatment center which provides people a safe haven where they can transform their lives. Habilitat Hawaii is like no other place on earth. Let's talk to Jeff Nash. Jeff Nash, all the way out there in Hawaii, Thank you so much for being on the podcast today and being willing to share your story. Well, thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. Awesome. So I know that um, you, you, you are currently the CEO of Habilitat, and I definitely want to talk about that because I think that what Habilitat provides is vital in this whole area. But what I'd like to know first is your history, because I believe you have your own drug story. Where were you? How old were you? How did you get started? What's your story there? Um, good question. I, it's, a, it's a long story, but I'll try and sum it up as best as possible. I began using substances, started with uh, alcohol and marijuana and some pills at 12 years old. <sighs> um, my father, you know, I grew up in, in Dallas, Texas in the 1960s at the end of the civil rights era. And my father was kind of what I would call a pseudo hippie. My mom was kind of the breadwinner. My father was going to university and getting an education, and he smoked marijuana recreationally. Um, and I stole marijuana from him um, and uh, shared it with my friends in the neighborhood at 12 years old. And it quickly got out of hand. I became rebellious. Of course, you know, I come from a slightly dysfunctional family, whatever that means these days. Uh, but it quickly accelerated and um, it went from, uh, you know, booze and marijuana to pills to then like LSD. And eventually, by the time I was 16 years old, I was I was shooting heroin. Um, 16? And it got really out shooting of, heroin? 16, yeah, yeah. In fact, oh. it was my 16th birthday that I began to shoot uh, intravenously. And uh, it was heroin, uh, cocaine, methamphetamine, basically whatever I could get my hands on. But I... I enjoyed the uh, effects from the, the opiates. You know, I really, I really enjoyed that. Of course, my parents were terrified uh, because it got out of hand. I, I attended my first rehab at 12 years old. They put me in a psychiatric lockup, psychiatric hospital. Uh, and of course, that made me very angry. I was going to uh, say, I bet that was really not successful. No. And, you know, the thing is, they did what they thought was right. They didn't yeah. know, you know, kids don't come with a manual. Uh, my, my parents were kids when they had me. So they did, you know, now that I'm older, I look back, well, they did the best that they could, but, uh, I rebelled. I got very angry. I felt abandoned. I felt unloved. Um, and, uh, it just went downhill from there. Of course, uh, you know, I, I continued to go in and out of rehabs, uh, total of 14 rehabs, wow. um, throughout my life and I was actually in a boarding school a treatment boarding school that even made it worse um and and it just got out of hand I had a lot of uh, child, adverse childhood experiences that had not been resolved uh and you know my parents tried but um they just didn't know what to do and and um I just went down that road um and it, it increased and 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 it just got out of hand uh you know in my teenage years I began to uh, have run-ins with the law, uh, juvenile, and then eventually as an adult in jail, uh, overdosed uh, several times, uh, got MRSA, ended up nearly dying from that. Um, lots What's of, MRSA? Uh, I'm sorry. MRSA is uh, um, basically it's methicillin-resistant staphylococcus. It's a very bad infection, oh, that's right. staph infection that's that right. uh, is resistant to most uh, antibiotics. So I was uh, hospitalized for that, actually, and nearly died. Um, lots of those kind of things, been stabbed, been beaten very badly uh, in altercations. It was a rough life. Um, Were you always it, in, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Were you always no, in no. Dallas or? So, yeah, I was actually born in, of all places, Norman, Oklahoma, at the University of Oklahoma. 
uh, OU, o Oklahoma University, and at a year old, uh, my parents moved to Dallas, Texas. My father was in the real estate business, and he was booming at that point. Um, so I, you know, I grew up in Dallas until okay. I was 18. Uh, so a lot of my, uh, well, all of my initial drug use and all the craziness happened uh, in Dallas, Texas. Okay. So, so yeah. Sorry, no, go ahead. I didn't. I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, but obviously, at some point, I want to lead you down the road to the point where you, your point of no return, where you kind of, you know, realized you had to get help. Yeah, and that's a great, um, a great point. Um, my drug use continued. I went in and out of jail. Um, at age 18, my parents sent me to Hawaii to a rehab in Hawaii. They, what, what used to happen is they put me in a rehab and I would run away. Uh, in uh, Dallas. So they figured if they brought me to an island, maybe you know, it was a long swim home. Can't um, go very far. Exactly. So uh, they marooned me on, a, on an island in the Pacific, as I like to say. Hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I did well for a while and um, uh, went through the program and eventually went back to Texas against the advice of the program. I went back to Texas to attend university. Uh, I was 21 years old at the time and everything unraveled again. Uh, I should have never gone back to uh, where all the water was flowing under the bridge, if you will. And um, lots and lots of things happened. Uh, but uh, long story short, I ended up coming back to Hawaii and um, eventually got arrested here uh, and put in jail. And by that time, um, I was on methadone. I was on 90 milligrams of methadone, still using heroin. And I got put in jail. And my there were actually two points of returns that... Uh, were connected. Uh, the first one was kicking uh, methadone and heroin on the floor of the jail with no assistance whatsoever. Uh, it was the most miserable experience of my life. And it was that point that I had an aha moment that, uh, you know, this was, it was the point of no return. Something had to change. I couldn't keep doing this. I didn't want, it wasn't fun anymore. The drugs weren't fun. The, the lifestyle wasn't fun. I was homeless. I was living in the streets of Chinatown in Honolulu, wow. and it was very lonely. It was very sad. I had infections and um, overdosing. It was just a horrible experience. So I found myself on the floor of the jail, and that's when I decided, you know, I, I've got to do something different. I got to get. And I reached out to the rehab that uh, I had been in, you know, when I was 18. Yeah. Um, and at this point, I was 29 years old. Um, really had no job skills to speak of, uh, didn't see a way out. It was doom and gloom. But I, I, something told me to reach out to, you know, the program and they got me out of jail, brought me into the program and I began to do well. I've, I've always done well in a structured environment. Right. Um, even in, in school, um, you know, the big classrooms, I did very poorly, but when they put me in smaller classrooms, I excelled. So I need structure in my life. That's what I learned from that. But the second aha moment came when I was 11 months into the program. It's a long-term program. Uh, I was 11 months in. I was doing very well. And I went to court for a unrelated, well, for a, a, a basically a drug conviction here in Hawaii. And the judge said, well, I have both good and bad news. Good news is I'm going to put you on probation again. Um, and the bad news is that there is an extradition warrant. They want you in Texas. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, so five years or six years earlier, I had absconded from Dallas um, on probation and it just kind of disappeared. And they finally caught up with me. So I was put in jail yet again, uh, extradited back to Texas. It was a very humbling experience to be shackled and on a plane. I'll never forget the, the stewardess coming or the a flight attendant coming back asking the sheriff, how are we going to feed the prisoner? And seeing everybody turn around and look at me, I thought, my God, they think I'm a murderer or rapist or whatever. Oh. So uh, I was transported back to Dallas, held without bond. And uh, the program went to bat for me. And they sent a representative to speak on my behalf in court, all that sent them to Dallas. And long story short, I was placed back on probation and allowed to go back to Hawaii to the, then finish the program. That was the end all point of no return that was the point that i decided my nine lives are over i'm never going to get high again and i'm never going to change my mind now the hard work begins what do i need to do to make sure that that's 
uh, um, a fact, right? Wow. And then I immersed myself into the program and I decided at that point, if you can't beat them, you might as well join them. <laughs> and uh, that was the turning point in my life. Does that, okay. does that answer the question fairly yeah, well? It definitely answers the question. I want to I wanna mention a couple of things when you were talking about how you were on methadone. You know, we have talked to um, several different people who um, work in the rehab field. And, you know, they have said one for one that the withdrawal from methadone is way worse than the withdrawal from heroin. And I think a lot of people don't quite understand that because, well, methadone is like given to you by, you know, doctors or clinics. Yeah, well, it's a synthetic and the, you know, the synthetic, whether it's methadone or suboxone, the withdrawal can be absolutely horrendous. And the other thing I wanted to comment on, because, you know, we've had lots and lots of, you know, people in recovery, recovered sober people, and a lot of them go back to work in that area. Do you know? And I think mm -hmm. that it's, um, yeah, anyway, it's commendable. Now, the program that you did was Habilitat, correct? Correct. Correct. Okay. Twice. I did it twice. <laughs> twice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. When you were 18 and then when you were 29. So. Right. So what made you wanted to work there? And that was part of your kind of epiphany or your realization mm -hmm. there? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, to, to speak to the first part of this, yes, from my experience, methadone is one of the most horrible drugs uh, known to man. Second, uh, well, right alongside uh, the benzos. They're pretty bad, too. Um, I've kicked heroin and methadone. Uh, methadone lasts way longer. The, the withdrawals, it's a horrible, horrible thing. Um, it's used as a compromise for people who supposedly can't get clean or whatever. I don't like this stuff. I don't endorse it. I think uh, I, I warn people off of it. Um, the, uh, the, the well, excuse to, me, but it's also kind of the yeah. mindset of like substituting one drug for another. And how yeah, yeah. is that going to lead to sobriety? Right. And and my mission now, obviously, is to try to figure out how I can teach individuals how to live beyond their addiction. And it is possible. There's lots of us that have done it and go on to lead pretty normal lives. Um, you ask, uh, you know, what led me to working in the industry? Um, what happened is through the treat program, um, you know, we were actually there was like a peer mentorship kind of thing that went on. Uh, where I was expected to help the next guy. We have a concept, each one teach one. So I was, you know, when a new guy came in, I was expected to try and help him acclimate and, and understand the, the process or whatever. And through that, what I learned is that I had a knack um, for connecting with people. And I had a knack for identifying um, uh, character traits that were positive and, and pulling them out of people. And then I think the program uh, officials, the, the administrators recognized that and they they taught me and they worked with me. And, uh, you know, it wasn't long before I was helping facilitate um, the treatment program. Uh, and of course, they sent me for training and they did a lot of in-house training. And, um, you know, it was the stars kind of lined up. I was actually as I was training to be a clinician. Uh, I was the last person that was trained by the person, the, the people who founded the program. They passed away, unfortunately, in 2000 and 2002, respectively. Mm -hmm. And I had just been trained. I was the last person to be trained. So it was kind of like, uh, you know, it just kind of got handed to me and like, here, you're trained and we're leaving now and it's your turn to carry on this work. So, you know, I sat and thought, well, you know, what what higher calling is there than to help fellow human beings and I seem to have an act for it um, so I just decided okay well if we're going to do this we're going to just like the drugs if I'm going to do something I'm all in um, so uh, and you know, I've heard that extreme. before too I've heard that yeah, before we're, you know we're, approaching approaching sobriety in the same way that the I, I, there was a gentleman who said I approached it the same way I approached you know the drugs living for the drugs and having to have the drugs I just decided to approach sobriety that way which is yeah that, that is a, a really good approach, in my opinion. Um, but, you know, that was uh, that was 2000. So it's been, you know, 20. I, I've been clean now for 25 years. Um, I, I was the program director at that program for about 16 years. About five years ago, I became the executive director. 
So uh, that's how it all happened. Of course, there's lots and lots of stories. I survived hepatitis C. I survived the, the treatment of hepatitis C as well uh, back in the day when it was grueling. Now it's a little bit more uh, humane, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there's lots of stories along the way. Um, I did attend 14 treatment programs. Most of them were short term, 30 day uh, stents where they medicate you, send you to meetings. Uh, I did, you know, I did that whole routine. In my um, life, what I needed was more. Um, 30 days wasn't going to do it. I had issues that went beyond the substance use. <clears throat> In my opinion today, the substance use was a symptom, not the problem. Right. And when I, I came to Habilitat, I began to, they, they helped me work through some of the problems. Um, and then when I came out the other end, I didn't feel the same. I was the same person, but I didn't have all the baggage. Uh, it had been reconciled. And um, I had, I saw the light at the end of the tunnel. I came yep. to believe and see that I could, I could have some, some of the good things in life. And, and I wasn't going to be addicted to drugs for the rest of my life. I saw that it didn't have to be that way. And I saw that through the examples around me. Um, and I believe that, you know, if they can do it, then so can I. Um, yep. So that, that really helped me a lot. And, and I think that's huge. I, I think it's huge. You know, um, we, um, after, after doing this podcast for four plus years, you know, we know that there is a light at the end of that tunnel and that, um, you can be sober and, you know, you said something else and it left me for a second, but I'm sure I'll remember and interrupt you again. You are listening to the addiction podcast point of no return for more information on the podcast or to reach out. If you have a story you would like to share with us, go to our Facebook page by the same name, or you can email us at the addiction podcast at yahoo.com or go to our website, the addiction podcast.com or call us at 727-314-314. 7080. And please remember to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five star review. Sometimes the hardest thing about getting someone into recovery is getting them to agree to treatment. Bobby Newman, a certified drug counselor with 30 years experience and an over 85% success rate as an interventionist, has created a series of 12 videos that you can use right now to learn every step to get your loved one to agree to treatment. Call 1-833-918-0008 today and say the word podcast to get a 10% discount. Or go to newmaninterventions.com and type in the word podcast for a 10% discount. The service comes with a free one-hour consultation with Bobby. One of the things that I looked at on the website about Habilitat, where you work, you know, one of the things that I think is lacking and is starting to come up, but I don't think to the extent that you guys do, which is the support for someone who is in recovery that is no longer use, abusing drugs and alcohol. But as you said, and I've heard this before from people who started on drugs at a young age like you did, they lack the life skills to, you know, be able to survive. And um, obviously they're not going to sell drugs. They're not going to do that. So they, they need skills. Um, tell us about the, the kind of like the after program, if you will, that you guys do. Because I think that's a huge part of Habilitat. That's my understanding. And I think it's You're so correct. needed. Yeah, so uh, uh, Habilitat was founded by a guy named Vinnie Marino, who was an ex-addict uh, from New York, a heroin addict from New York, in 1971. And he realized way back then that this 30-day model, uh, he called them Band-Aid programs. And, and look, I'm not trying to knock any, you know, the thing is any treatment's better than no treatment. But he recognized that there were quite a few uh, people <clears throat> that needed more than just a 30-day stint. And they needed, they needed more than just, you know, abstinence. They needed to be retrained. They needed uh, to increase their level of emotional intelligence, uh, mm -hmm. which is taught, by the way. We're not born with that. We, we learn it through modeling in our life, from, through our parents or whatever. They needed job skills. They needed to increase their education level. 
Uh, you know, there was this, all these different things, which ironically now is actually a uh, evidence-based criminogen- a criminology approach to treating, um, uh, to reducing recidivism, basically. Um, positive leisure activities, uh, you know, this is one of them as well. So what he did is he designed a program that would be, uh, you know, long, where it's a live-in experience where they address the addiction with evidence-based techniques. Uh, and then and then they would teach trades, you know, so, you know, we we actually we have probably the most evolved vocational workforce development program uh, that's attached to a treatment program in the nation. Um, we in fact, we have programs where you can become like a certified di- di- uh, dietitian, a certified fitness trainer. People get their uh, contractor's license. We have a construction company. We have a, uh, we got 18 different treatment, uh, uh, different uh, training programs. Uh, And each one is curriculum based and they are geared towards uh, a a clear path to a living wage. Um, So, you know, all of that is part of it too. But we actually have a phase, the the final phase of our program is called post reentry. And it's it's all about transitioning. Um, We bring in, uh, bankers to talk about credit. We bring in educators to help uh, do mock interviews, writing resumes. We have computer training classes, um, on-site high school for those who didn't do high school. We have some some college courses that they can take. Um, and, and all these things are geared towards preparing someone for a smooth transition. Uh, we are very proud of the fact that 100% of our graduates are gainfully employed prior to leaving the program. Wow. And 100% are in stable housing. So it's a it's a requirement. Of that's the huge. I mean, that's huge. You know, I mean, I've heard of some rehabs that have some sort of reentry program, but not like that. That's amazing. Right. Well, and we recognize that, you know, if somebody's going to go through treatment and then leave, they've got to have uh, a way to earn a living. And they have to have a way to earn a living that they feel good about that, that, that increase their esteem, that, that enhances their esteem. Uh, you know, most of the people that come to us, their, their self-esteem is shot, their self-image is just destroyed. So yeah. we, we go about rebuilding that through a merit-based system of accomplishments, goal setting, those kind of things. Um, so, you know, when you, when you look at the globally at the Habilitat's treatment program, yes, part of it is, you know, um, evidence-based treatment, cognitive behavioral therapy, those kind of motivational interviewing, group sessions, all that. But um, that's like the first six months. There is a a whole other uh, year, two years sometimes of of life training to prepare someone, Um, conflict resolution, relationships, you know, everything you could possibly imagine that uh, is typically a stumbling block for those that are are in recovery. Um, So it's a it's a what we've tried to do is create a program in a very nice place. We're on the ocean front, obviously. It's a beautiful place, which is a nice place to heal. But we, we've tried to bring wraparound services into the organization to meet the needs of every individual, whether it be uh, parenting classes. Uh, we have a you know, parenting uh, program, uh, the job skill stuff, obviously, um, anger management. I mean, everything you can possibly think of. And we're constantly evolving, trying to add more. Um, so our, our, our goal is to expose people long-term to a positive lifestyle that's based on hard work, family values, pro-social attitudes and behaviors. And, and then we work with people to develop those over a couple of years. We found that it takes two years to instill, um, this kind of, uh, uh, thing into people's lives and because they have to practice it. It's not a matter of you just teach it and they do it. They have to practice it. Yep. I, I think that was the thing I was trying to remember was that when you were talking about 30 day programs and, you know, we don't diss any of the programs on this podcast, but the percentage of people that can actually get clean and sober in 30 days, it's a really small percentage. And those programs lack what you guys do. Now, do you take people who are have gotten clean and sober they're like in recovery but now they need to do kind of the rest of the program do you take people at that level as well we certainly will um obviously it's a large commitment um we're very proud of i uh, we're very proud of the fact we take most of the people we treat are here in hawaii but we do take people from the mainland and actually i i have had people come that uh, you know they hadn't used drugs or alcohol in a long time but they just couldn't get started in life 
Right. Uh, so they came, they came for the other training or whatnot, uh, uh, whatever. Um, so yeah, we, we certainly will work with people if they, if they're serious about it, we're looking for people that they are, we're kind of like in my spot, like I'm done. I just need somebody to show me how, what do I do? I've, I've had enough of this. Um, you know, it's unfortunate. You mentioned about the, the, the short-term programs and I certainly don't diss them as well. God knows we need them. Um, we're not the end all do all. We don't claim to be, um, but, you know, our founder years ago told us that, you know, the writing's on the wall. The third party payment system basically created a situation where they're only going to pay for X amount of days of treatment or whatever. And then and then the industry designed itself around that, which yep. is unfortunate because everybody I know, even those uh, uh, um, practitioners that work in the short term programs, they would much rather have people for six, nine months, a year or something like that. And there's plenty of uh, science science that points to the fact that the you know length of episode of treatment determines uh, you know outcomes or whatever. So um, yep. yeah, I, I yeah. agree with your assessment of that completely. Yep. So so here's my next question. So when are you going to start up Habilitat programs everywhere? Uh, Put you on the spot. I get asked that. A franchise. I, I, yeah. And, and, <laughs> yeah. So here's what I say. Um, it takes everything that we have to do the program that we do well. We have a large population. We have 100, we're the largest treatment center in the state of Hawaii, licensed treatment center. We have 150 beds. We keep our population between 110 and 120 on purpose so that we don't ever have a, we never have a waiting list. Um, of course, COVID has complicated that a little bit, but um, I, here's the problem with opening uh other programs um it takes a level of commitment by the staff um it's not easy to find people that are committed to that level um to to run another program uh at habilitat we basically grow our own um yep. most of the people it's very interesting we're all the people that run habilitat we're all byproducts in yep. fact our bylaws state that the person that holds my position has to have gone through the program um, so it has to be someone who's had the experience. Now I do have licensed uh, people. Um, we have an RN who's licensed. My accountant is an outside hire or whatever. Um, so although I think it would be good to have programs like Abilitat around the country, uh, I certainly don't, <laughs> I don't have the energy to try and run another one. It takes everything that I have to do this one well, but I will say this, the model is being used in other places around the country. Okay. Most people have probably heard of Delancey Street. Um, that's in California. It was founded uh, the same year as Habilitat. Uh, actually, the two guys that founded Habilitat and Delancey Street were friends. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's still very relevant. But there recently, there's been a couple of programs that have popped up around the country that are using the model. There's one that I went to visit, stayed, actually stayed a week. Uh, and immersed myself in their program. It's in Salt Lake City. It's called the Other Side Academy. Um, so what's happened is graduates from the old school uh, therapeutic communities have now gone and started their own programs. Yep. Um, and they're all doing well. There's another That's one awesome. on the East Coast called Trosa. You know, there's there's several smaller ones around the country that are using the model and with very good outcomes. So okay. I would rather teach somebody or, you know, let other people go try that um, than try and do it myself. Well, and that's really what I mean is to be able to export what has worked for Habilitat. And it sounds like that is actually happening. And that's very encouraging. Um, we have heard of people, you know, doing sober coaching. And, you know, while I think that that's valuable, I think that the level that you do at Habilitat, I think is a, a whole different level. Do you have like buy-in from local companies? Have you brought them into your oh, fold? Yeah. Okay, I would think you would have to because yeah. then you get them to hire these people. Yeah, so over 50 years, we've developed relationships with people here in Hawaii that uh, they support us. And, you know, the irony is we, we don't bill insurance because we're not a medical facility and we are not connected to government funding. We do everything ourselves. We're, we're teaching people self-reliance and independence. 
And it's really important that we model that as an organization and we practice it as well. So yeah, we have um, a, a very large portfolio of companies here in Hawaii that will hire our graduates. Uh, in fact, I get at least one phone call a week from employers saying, hey, we have openings, we have openings. Um, and that's a testament to the level of our training because they would rather hire our people because they show up on time, they don't call in sick, they take accountability, they're self-starters, and, and, and that's what they're trained to do, right? Right. So, um, yeah, we can always get somebody a job 100% of the time, and typically they're pretty good. Wow. We just had a, a kid that had never had a job. Uh, he would never been employed. He was 22 years old. We taught him how to build fences, vinyl fences, chain link fences. And he got hired in the union. Um, they're, well, they're helping him get in the union. He got hired by a company that's with the union, $38 an hour to start wow. first job he's ever had based on the training that we provided him. So, wow. you know, does he have a fighting chance now? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's just fabulous. I, so I, I'm, I'm, What's the word? I'm so impressed. I'm awestruck by what you guys are doing there. I just think it's so needed. I'm glad to hear that there are other facilities like that throughout the country. Um, probably need more, um, you know, because I just feel like the what you're doing adds in just a huge element, you know. And, and there are some people that we've interviewed on the podcast who – you know, got clean and sober, um, maybe in prison, and they kind of looked at it as like, you know, like a, a jump start. We had um, a woman named Emily O'Brien who started a whole, um, it's a snack industry. It's like popcorn, I think, and snacks. And she hires, you know, people who have been incarcerated and she kind of educates companies on why you should do this, you know. So, but I think that, you know, not everybody has that kind of chutzpah, if you will. Mm -hmm. And, you know, depending on their background, like you say, and we've talked to a lot of people who just had real self-esteem issues. And it's very hard to be a self-starter when you're in that, you know, that position. And I think that mm -hmm. what you give these people is just, oh, it's amazing. It's, it's really very well done. Thank you for everything that you do. I am sure that you could go to a corporation and become a multi-billionaire, but uh, yeah, <laughs> Would, wouldn't be like what you're doing now. Yeah, I enjoy what I do, and uh, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to serve um, my people, my tribe, you know. That's awesome. And if people, someone wanted to check out Habilitat, it's just Habilitat.com, right? Yep, Habilitat.com. Um, we're on social media, Habilitat Hawaii. Uh, lots of, we have a very extensive website that kind of explains everything. And then of course, if anybody wants to learn more, you can call or we have a 1-800 number, 1-800-872-2525. Um, you can call. Um, if there are people interested in learning more about the model, feel free to give them my email address. Uh, I'd be happy to talk to anybody that wants to know about it. And um, yeah, that's, uh, we're awesome. here. Awesome. It's, it's great. Thank you so much, Jeff, for taking the time out of your busy work day early in the morning there in Hawaii to talk to us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Aloha. Aloha. You know, as I said um, during the interview with Jeff Nash, there are there is such a need for programs for people in recovery. Um, I think a lot of the people that we've talked to, that's what that's what they're doing, you know, rock to recovery, um, pro athletes in recovery. Um, I think that it's, there's a huge need for that. And I like what um, Habilitat is doing in Hawaii. So thank you for listening. We'll have another interview again next week. And please, if you or someone you know needs treatment, someone you know is addicted to drugs or alcohol, or you are, please just reach out. It's the hardest thing to do, but just reach out and get help however you do it. Thank you for listening. We'll talk to you again next week. You have been listening to The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information, reach out to us on Facebook or go to www.theaddictionpodcast.com. Our email is theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com.